with a with a with a person who changed not only yes. my professional life but also hello pascal how are you hey maxim nice you. good nice to good see morning you. here it's good morning but i know for you it is it is plus evening. what plus 10 uh i so think so we are seven o'clock right yeah yeah that's it yeah, plus yeah. 10 <laughs> That Good is amazing. to see you again. It's been a long time. Yeah, for sure. I'm really. I, I told to my followers that I'm really nervous and uh, and excited because it is not always possible to talk to a real life legend, to my mentor. <laughs> I, I consider you my mentor. Oh, my. You changed. You changed. You have changed my professional life. And you know, this is actually the Bible that I have always in my working place, in my home everywhere so this is the book that i referred <laughs> like a number one in dentistry in veneers adhesive <laughs> restorations and whatever i want you to yeah. sign can you sign can you sign online the book but i, I don't have your signature <laughs> <Voila. Yeah. laughs> this is a historical moment perfect oh thank you very my much. gosh thank you thank you for perfect. your kind so I, will, words. I will switch off the comments because we would i would like to discuss with you a really uh, interesting and practical topic and uh, we have some questions that people ask us in advance before so we will just go for a discussion with no with no comments that are coming from the audience if you don't mind it will be more clear uh, picture and I think it will be more efficient for us to communicate so we start I want I know that you are very busy I want I don't want to waste your time so let's start with uh, with this conversation that we rise up like ideas if absolutely it really uh, helps or it wastes our practical life uh, before I would like to rise up three main problems that actually we have in uh, restorative and in prosthetic dentistry like uh, utilizing indirect restorations, we as practical dentists may face with post-operative sensitivity, especially when we work with the uh, vital teeth. So this is the problem number one that I faced like 10 or 15 years ago. I was, I was dying. I was, I was crying when I, I prepped vital teeth and then my patient called me back and whatever. Then we have problem like um, debonding, especially when we start to do minimally invasive restorations like uh, veneers or tabletop occlusal veneers we face non-retentive basically yeah yeah non-retentive restoration is correct and another problem that we still have is that sometimes it's pretty difficult for us to define where to go crown or minimally invasive restoration like crown or veneer mm -hmm. crown or overlay what, 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 because I, still Maxim, not... excuse me i don't i don't understand what, what's a crown i don't know this restoration <laughs> <laughs> i got it i, I don't okay, know what is this know. i haven't you don't know it's this, been like I, I, I remember something about it from 30 okay. years ago but it came out of my memory so <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are special. That's why. That's why you are here. We would like to see to 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 hear your opinion. On that. But people still face with a with a problem to find out which restoration to go if the dentin is exposed, for example, to do crown or to do veneer or to do right. tabletop or whatever. Because still people do not right. believe in adhesive dentistry. Since we are in twenty first yes. century, people still do not believe in. And he's a dentistry, and I would like to ask you your opinion. Why? Why it is so? Well, you know, still after uh, more than 2,000 years, despite all the miracle Jesus did, people still don't believe in Jesus. So <laughs> the same happens with adhesive dentistry. You know, yeah, you have some time people are like uh, Thomas, you know, they need to see the whole in Jesus' hand. And I can tell you one thing, uh, Maxim. I had a student, he was a prosthodontic student, and uh, he was very skeptical about uh, dentin boning and that stuff. And he came to my lab to do a research on uh, uh, basically fatigue testing of completely flat tops, flat tops. The article was published, and um, we just made like cylinders, cylindrical block of CEREC with composites, and we bonded them on a flat uh, molar, right? With a little bit of peripheral enamel and dentin inside. And 
we fatigued those and they wouldn't break. The only was five millimeter thick, right? Amazing. Bonded yeah. either yeah. with, with uh, dual cure or with real composite, but they wouldn't break and you could see the tooth bend, bend, bend. And we went to loads that were, you know, like 250 kilograms of load on one tooth to break that bond. And when he saw that, he was like, wow, yeah, I can see it now. And it's a little bit the same, you know, you, you can come up with those huge numbers. People will still not believe. And the most common, the most common comment I see is people saying, yeah, yeah, but dentin bond degradates over time. And that's true. Dentin bond doesn't stay at its top. It, it, it decreases, right? So you want to start with the highest number possible huh? so that the decrease will after okay. maybe, I don't know, five, ten years still be within an acceptable value, right? That's why you need to strive for the highest number. And what is our reference, Maxim? What do we try to copy when we do dentin bonding? Uh, we try to copy the natural... I'm testing your knowledge now. <laughs> <laughs> so biomimetic dentistry, biomimetic dentistry, we would like to... So what are we trying to copy with dentin bonding? We try to copy in, in the dentin enamel no junction. Enamel junction, exactly. Enamel junction. And so you cannot ignore there is one study that I love because it's the only one of this type. And it's a study made in, J in Japan by uh, Urabe and it tested the strength of the dentino enamel junction, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the only one. It's unbelievable. And they tested bovine teeth and human teeth. And with the same test we used to test dentin bonding agent, right? It's called the microtensile bone test. It's quite recognized. You can do better than that, but it's, it's a test that's pretty much standard. Guess what number they got? Uh, the connection mega to me. The, the unit is mega me. Uh, yeah, mega mega pasta. Pasta. Mega you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Tell me. I didn't. Okay, I didn't they got that. numbers for the bovine teeth was forty-seven megapascal, and for the human teeth, it was around fifty, fifty-one megapascal. Okay? So the, the strength of the junction is fifty-five yeah. megapascals. Okay, I will write. 50, I, I will, 50, 51. 50, I, 51. Doing, That's what they got. Like that. I'm doing. Yeah, no. yeah. That's the study mm -hmm. by Urabe. Urabe. Okay. And so. This is a golden standard, right? So our, now I have a question for you. I'm going to, to test your knowledge today, Maxim. I'm oh, wow. sorry, I have to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm much you are not there. expecting that. No, no, no. No, but the, no. Okay. Yeah, no, no. So they, that's, they see the, my the, examination. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. No, but no, no. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. Don't okay. worry. Don't worry. I'm ready. Uh, I'm ready. The thing you? is, with numbers, those numbers are important because... So with the dent, we know that the dentino enamel junction strength is the same. I mean, we don't know, but we can assume, right, that this, this bond between enamel and dentin, it is pretty permanent. Okay, now our adhesives are not permanent. That's the difference, okay? So the difference is that this 50 megapascal will be there the whole life. That's what I believe. I don't think the dentino enamel junction weakens. It may be because we don't have any data to, to disprove that. But let's say our adhesives for sure, the bond strength decreases. So we have to go higher than that number. You understand my point? For sure. yeah, so yeah. with dentin adhesives, 50 is not enough. You want to go maybe to 60, 70. And, and that's what we, we got when okay, we do our test. Okay, and, and so, so that after 10 years, maybe you still have 40 left. And that's yes. good. 40 is amazing. <laughs> that's a good point. Amazing. I so love it. That's my message to the non-believers. Now, let me tell you one thing. I agree with the non-believers. And you know why? Because most adhesives on the market don't work. <laughs> and there's too many products. You know, there is hundreds of adhesives. A few years ago, it was 100. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, it was 100. Now, I just heard the other day 
a, a, a lecture by, by Dr. Duarte, and he said that there is more than 300 adhesives. Imagine on the that, how like, many. People are confused, uh, actually, really confused. The confusion. So when people say, I don't believe, I agree with them, because mm -hmm. likely they have a bad adhesive, very likely. And so we can talk about that later, because there is adhesive and adhesive and adhesive. And you, we have four families, as you know. We have four families of dentin bonding agents. And the fact is only two of them work more or less, and some of them work really good. And so it's really like a, 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 a selection. Uh, there's a natural selection of adhesives. The fact is most people don't use the good adhesives because the good adhesives are old adhesives. Okay, can you, say, can you say which one is good or which one is bad, in your opinion, please? Because people <laughs> well, want this information. You look, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not they going to use my opinion. Dentists, they going... want to have something to work yeah, and to absolutely. have results. Absolutely. I totally Everywhere understand. I'm, and I'm not going to hide anything from you, Maxim, today. <laughs> That's not my goal. choice, by the way. Yeah. I have the same. But I would, you, want you to say that because you're a primary source. Yeah. We are referring to you. All the time. No, no, no. And, and I'm, I'm nobody, Maxim. I just refer to the science. Okay. And the science, if you look at all the review, meta-analytical review, the highest level of evidence, you will see that there are two types of adhesives that seem to work better. It's the total edge three-step and the self-edge two-step, right? And um, amongst those two families, we know the leading products are OptiBond FL in the Total Edge three step and SE Bond, SE Protect Bond in the uh, Self Edge two step. So those are the adhesives that have proven now long track record and reliability of those materials. Now, in the Total Edge three step, there's other products that have also proven to work very well, like Scotch Bond Multipurpose, you know, and uh, we'll see because now it's an avalanche of new products, new, 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 new. Now, you see uh, up even Kerr that had the golden standard Optimum FL three step Total Edge, they came up with a self edge now. Yeah, so that's why I would with... like to, to highlight one thing that I re realized from some communications with colleagues that some people, they actually, the many people can use this OptiBond FL or SE Bond, which considered to be a golden standard. So they can have the products, but they still have bad results. And the reason why yes. is that uh, protocol yeah. that they follow is not correct. That's Absolutely. Why because have to understand it's... that there is no Order. miracle, there is no magic in products. Okay. Totally. So first, you need the right product. Second, you need the right technique. Third, you need the right operator. You know? Because we know that the biggest variable, you know, there was a, a very interesting study made in Geneva back then. Oh, it was 20 years ago. It was called the Battle of the Bonds. <laughs> so people would take a CE course, they would come to the university, and they would bond little cylinders of composite on flat dentin surfaces. And you would have like 20 practitioners, right? And they would test different adhesives. And then the data was compiled. And guess what came out? The biggest variation was not adhesive A versus adhesive B. It was practitioner A versus practitioner B. So, the, the, you know, this is my message. And that was my conclusion, if you remember yesterday during the, the live I did, was you have to become an expert of, on, on bonding. You have to develop your skills on bonding. You, you, this is like absolutely necessary. And the operator is number one, I okay. would say. Then you have to choose the right product, number two. Then you have to use the right technique, number three, because I can mess up with Optibond FL and SE Bond too if I don't use them the right way, totally. and we will talk about Can it. Can I just briefly and really quickly uh, give a protocol that I use, and you will check if I'm correct mm -hmm. or not, and people can also sure. follow this because they need, they need uh, protocols. They are all of them, they're practical ones. Yes. They want to have something dentist, from our side. Dentists are uh, right, right side of the brain is weak sometimes in the dentist. They want left, which is like, ah, uh, protocols, step one, step two, yes, step yes, three, yes, right? We, Dentists, they, yeah. they, they build up like this. We have to go A, B, C, D, or whatever. Yeah. Sometimes we jam, right. jam from A to D, but the results will be not. Yes. 
good. So uh, for Total Edge system, like Optimum NFL, let's say, or similar, I will cover the, uh, the classic protocol, including enamel and dentin bonding, okay? So we edge enamel for 30 seconds, and then we also edge dentin for no longer than 15 seconds. So basically, it's from 5 to 15 seconds dentin etching. Then we have to rinse, and we rinse now thoroughly. Now, it, de it depends what dentin, Maxim, right? You have to, to make a difference yeah. between so the, the different types of dentin. Or uh, tubular, yes. uh, puritubular, whatever, yes. yeah. But, but Maxim, mm. <laughs> there's one, before... You, one thing that I missed. I agree so far, roughening, but there's one roughening. more step. There's one more step. You already missed one step. Exactly, <laughs> roughening, right? Uh, roughening roughening the dentin. And that is freshly cut dentin. Rise of rubbing and isolation. That is yeah. the main step. Exactly, isolation. and before that, proper isolation. Yeah. So, so isolation, okay. freshly okay. cuts dentin. Now, Maxim, wait a minute. Okay. It depends what type of adhesive you use will influence how you freshly cut the dentin. And so, mm. with a total edge, you can use a diamond burr. This is my choice, a rough diamond. Why? Because it makes the dentin very rough. And this yeah. is one thing that the dentin... You know, at the dentino enamel junction, the dentin is like rough, very rough. Like waves. So, like waves, yeah. like the ocean. Imagine the surface of the ocean during a storm, and you freeze that, and that's how dentin looks like. If you remove enamel from the surface, you will see the dentin at the DJ looking like that. And so, how do you copy that? You copy that with diamond, rough diamond cutting, so you plow those grooves in dentin, and that increases the contact surface. Okay, you yeah, understand? correct. Yeah, for okay. sure. So rubbing and so isolation, is, roughening of the dentin with a diamond if right. we are using total edge system. Then we edge yes. enamel, 30 yes. seconds. Then we edge dentin for, from 5 to 15 seconds, depends on the type of the dentin that we have. Then we rinse, we have to rinse with a exactly. lot of water. So the, the type of dentin again, if you have sclerotic dentin, eroded dentin, uh, because this dentin is more mineralized sometimes and the dentin tubules are closed, so you go a little bit uh, longer on that dentin. You can go to 20, 25 seconds, right? Okay, for sclerotic dentin. So guys, note, yeah. write down. Sclerotic dentin, 20, 25 seconds. Yeah. I love it. I love this discussion. So next, we rinse with the water, with a lot of water. We have to rinse similar time that we apply or even longer. Just remove everything. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? And then we go into the drying uh, process and we have to be careful in order not to have dentin over dry and not yes. to have dentin over wet. So basically what I do, I dry rubbing them around and I have reflected air that goes to enamel and enamel becomes dry and dentin still is wet. Then I take right. suction, take out the pipe from the suction. I will show which one, just a second. Here, I'm taking this out, and I just a little bit of the uh, water from uh, with my suction system. And then after- And now there is one thing, let me tell you a detail also, that many, many dentists, uh, they miss that point. I see that when I give CE courses, is that while they dry the dentin and they go like you did with the tip, they go very close. And I deal with that all the time with my students. They touch the enamel margins with yeah, okay. the instruments. And that you should avoid at all costs. Because you see, uh, even when, with, with the next step, when you are going to apply the primer, I see people brush the primer in the undercut. And while they do that, they rub the enamel that they just etched. They rub it with the plastic of the brush. That's a big problem. Oh, wow. That is the tip. Guys, write down all these tips. Right. Don't yes. touch enamel with a, with, a, with a suction. Don't touch enamel uh, with a brush, with a, no. with a plastic uh, part of the brush. Otherwise, you will have a lot of uh, white lines on your margins. <laughs> yeah, see how many tips. Oh, my God. So actually, next. I, applying up primer, we have to apply a correct amount of the primer. So basically, it's written in instruction. Uh, we apply it actively for 20 seconds, apply, and then we dry. And there yeah. is another tip that I learned from yesterday. We dry it in the way to remove the solvent, but to keep dentin slightly shiny. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. So the idea is that 
I try when I dry the dentin, like I think you said that uh, before when you were drying the tooth, to apply a laminar flux of air. So you go, let's say, from lingual with the suction, from buccal with the air, parallel to the occlusal surface. So in that way, what happens? The air really dries the enamel very well because it's at the surface, and the dentin stays a little bit moist, right? And then you look at the dentin, and the dentin should look shiny, but no movement of fluids. And you could, if it's, if it's dry correctly, you should be able to see the roughness that you created with the burr, but it's nice. still shiny. And uh, that means, and I know you will agree with me like a 500 person, that means you need good magnification for that, right? Magnification. Magne, magnification. <laughs> Love it. At least, at least 8.0. <laughs> wow. You, you switched into the uh, 9, I, I heard yesterday. Well, no, I just added, added ah, the, um, the, the, the um, uh, reading modification mm. to my glasses, which is a big, a small loop. It's an additional lens, if you want. Huh? Okay. It makes reading magnification. It's like you can add one point time there or two two times, and that, that reduces the, the, distance the distance that you work. Okay, correct. So I work at a very short working distance. People are usually shocked to see. Why? Because if I go 8.0 and I decrease the distance, I can reach 9 or 9.5. Nine yeah. Well, so let's go back. Uh, primer, yes. 20 seconds, active application. Don't touch enamel with a plastic uh, part of the, the brush. Then we dry in yes. order to have it. The oh, and the dentin, the primer, the primer of the dentin. Apply as many layers as you want. I mean, the more you, you want to saturate the dentin. So usually I apply the primer twice, you know, mm. two times 20 seconds, even okay. sometimes three times. Right. And you have to look at the dentin. There are some teeth when you dry, suddenly the dentin is dull again. That means you need to reapply until it's shiny. Okay, nice. Nice point, by the way. Thank you. Okay, and then we uh, finally apply adhesive, which is second bottle. We apply to enamel and to dentin. I would like to right. just mention one more time, so no. we're discussing classic protocol, including enamel right. and dentin bonding. Right. It's not ideal. Right. And what adhesive? What adhesive? What type of adhesive are you applying? Because that will influence the technique too. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about Total Edge, the two-bottle system, first generation. Right. But, uh, field adhesive or unfilled field. adhesive? Ah, okay. Field. Field ah. Adhesive. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Good point, by so the way. So that's, that's because that's point. different. So mm -hmm. I, I, you see, here, my point is I really, I highly suggest a field adhesive. And um, the reason is that a field adhesive is more viscous and it will make a more uniform layer. This is why OptiBond FL is such a unique product, you know, mm. um, because it will, because of the filler, by the way, which is radiopaque, it's a radiopaque filler. You have to have radio opacity if you have a, a thick filler. And my point is that, uh, a thick adhesive. And my point is that the adhesive make a more uniform layer and the thickness, and even if you air, even if you would air dry gently the adhesive, it is still thicker than the oxygen inhibition layer. And that's very important. That's why I suggest a filled uh, adhesive. SE bond, uh, I believe, is filled too, but much, much less than Optibond okay. FL. In Optibond FL, you know what, what means F and L? Uh, filled, light cured, right? Okay. Because the first version of Optibond was dual cure. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it was called it. Optibond. And when in 1992, can you believe that, Maxim? Optibond came on the market in 1992. And in 1994, uh, they, they came with FL, with the radiopaque filler. I mean, the, at the beginning, the filler was not radiopaque. It was later on. I yeah, think. it was but 1995. Radio opaque right, yes. filler. 1994 was not low radio opaque. Well, maybe even later. I think the radiopaque filler was even later than 1995. Mm. Okay. So, okay, so you apply the adhesive. We're applying adhesive. Yeah, we, are, we have to keep thick layer of adhesive on dentin yes, and thin layer and of thin adhesive on, on enamel. enamel. 
okay? Totally. If we are using highly filled bonding agent, it's okay. If we don't have uh, filled adhesive, so we can reinforce our hybrid layer by adding of the thin layer of flowable composite. Is it correct? Exactly. And that's the okay. point. And that's what I would do with SE bond. Okay. Exactly. One question. Um, before uh, you apply a flowable composite, do you light cure SE bond or you apply SE yes. bond? Yes. And you, you light cure, light cure? and okay. then you apply the flowable. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. So that, is, that was the, the classic adhesive protocol to use total edge system that we actually described and in a few words just about total edge system like se bond um, uh, utilization so in this case we go for selective edge self -edge, yeah self -edge. self edge so we do selective yeah, yeah. edge with edge enamel for 30 seconds okay okay so <laughs> you have two I would like ways to make it just the... just a step by step yes yes, yes, yes. so if you use a self etching agent Okay. Actually, there is two ways. I would say there is the, 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 the productive way and then there is the maniac way. <laughs> the maniac. 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 Okay. okay. So the, the production, the efficient way would be, yes, you have to etch enamel separately for sure. You, you cannot trust the self-etch on enamel. Okay. So you have to etch enamel and then apply your self-etch and then apply your adhesive. But the maniac way would be to seal the dentin first. First. With your ah, yeah. Edge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then reprep your enamel margins, and then you etch everything, and then you reapply. You apply the adhesive to enamel and the sealed dentin. That's the way to do it. Uh, if you are a maniac of adhesive, why? Because. How do you etch maximum enamel? Yes, with the microscope, maybe you can do it. But, uh, you know, I'm thinking about daily practice. How do you etch enamel it depends without on the etching surface. dentin? Yeah, sometimes yeah. we can use that like a cotton pellet to protect dentin if we have class one or class two cavities. And we just yeah. etch enamel. Mm -hmm. We use... So uh, if you want, I, would, I like to say immediate dentin sealing is the ideal way of yeah. applying a self-action. Uh, now I agree with that. I didn't know this, by the way, and, uh, since yesterday. So I learned this technique. Ah, yes, yes, yes. yes. Nice. Mm -hmm. Always learning from you, always. That is nice. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, self-etching. Then we do acid primer for the dentin actively. Then you dry. Then we apply adhesive, both on enamel and uh, dentin, keeping thick layer on the dentin and reinforce light cure. And then we reinforce a uh, hybrid layer with a flowable composite in this case. So that is technique. If it's a self edge, yes. If it is, yeah, we are talking now about self edge. So that is, this is technique, guys, that you have to keep in your mind to have uh, good results. You cannot skip any of these steps. Otherwise, skipping of any of these steps will compromise the result that you may achieve later on. That's why the process is, I feel as clinician, the process takes time. We have to, to, to admire that. And in case, when I prep, for example, 10 veneer units, and imagine that I exposed dentin for all of these 10 veneers, 10 teeth after preparation, I will have to go like a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, just for the ideas. And we need, to, I, we need to explain to people why we have to invest this time, what we will get out of this investment, what kind of benefits we will get out of the IDS implementations, because there are still a lot of questions and a lot of arguments regarding the IDS. For people, some, some people, they say, we don't use IDS and because it takes time. We don't use IDS because it doesn't influence the result that this, this is what they can say for some time. But what I can say from my time, from my side, sorry, since I started to use ideas, I sleep well. Okay? My phone is oh, not... and then, but Maxim, Maxim, um, what happens if you have post-operative sensitivity under a veneer? That can be a huge problem. I exactly. have seen it. Exactly. I've seen, you know, uh, veneer cases that were sent to me because they had sensitivity and when I read the protocol they didn't use IDS. I saw uh, onlays that had sensitivities, the uh, IDS was not done and so now the consequences you can pay that, it's, it's very expensive. So this, uh, let's say on an onlay preparation you are going to spend maybe three minutes doing IDS and then you have 
it's a huge it's for three minutes it's like the best investment you have <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you, know, you have I to redo the restoration huh uh, redoing the restoration is much, much, much more expensive. more expensive. Not to talk about the pain and the time the patient has to come back to the chair. And not to talk about uh, sensitivity during the provisional stages. Uh, all the other thing. I mean, um, honestly, the time factor to me, it's a very weak argument. Yeah. Same, same here. I'm a slow dentist. I can <laughs> play with the adhesive for, for a long time. So basically what actually, what are the main benefit that I got from the idea since I started to use it is that the post-operative cases that now I have is almost zero. I have few. Exactly. Sometimes exactly. I have and some. Maxim, Maxim, not only that, but I had a dentist come to me. He took my course like you did in Geneva uh, but it was in San Francisco. And then he sent me uh, a message. He said, it's unbelievable. My rate of endodontics has dropped completely. So it's, you know, uh, and I've seen that, you know, it's very sad when you lose a pulp because you messed up the bond. That's a disaster. You, yeah, you open great. the circle of death of a tooth because of a bad bonding. That's really, really sad. And so what you just said, you know, you have to imagine, Maxim, in many offices, a, a permanent post-operative sensitivity means endo. And that's... Unfortunately, so, yeah. So it's the same, the same statistics here in Ukraine. The same. And so really, exactly as you said, when we were... You said that at the beginning. When we started doing indirect restorations, we were scared to death about post-operative sensitivity. We were like making a prayer every time we, we bond a restoration. And that prompted, you, you know DDA very well, right? Guess what? My very first scientific article I published was about this problem. And it was in the early 90s. And we, what we did, we bonded on layers on teeth. We cut them and we look at the bond and we were shocked. Oh, the hybrid layer would separate from the composite. We, we, we would see gaps. And in those gaps, we know in the reality there is fluid. And when the patient bites, it's pumping the fluid, you know, the hydrodynamic theory. And mm. That's great. So now we, were, we looked at those gaps. We were shocked. And I, I, I don't know. I think it, we may have been the first one to publish that. I have to send you this article. It was in Quintessence International back in 1992, I think. And so that's when, when we discovered immediate dent in ceiling and we did the same experiments, no gaps, no gaps. And Maxim, the literature is huge about that. Not only our articles. It's, Researchers from all around the world have proven now yeah, truth. that this gap... There are gap, many independent resources nowadays. Prove this this gap is, is the, the result of the adhesive not being polymerized. So you, you have to polymerize the adhesive before placing the restoration. And that's the essence of immediate dentin sealing. If you place the adhesive and you have a preparation that is very irregular, you cannot prevent the adhesive to be thick in concavities and thin in convexities. And in the concavities, that thickness might exceed the dye spacer. And that's why the restoration will not see it unless you place the adhesive before taking your impression. And that is the, 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 the fundamentals of immediate dentin sealing. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't need a lot of research. You don't need to be high Einstein or a Nobel Prize to understand that. This is just common, common sense. Correct, exactly. No yes. evidence needed. It's like if you are on an airplane and you have a parachute, and the plane crashes, do you have more chance to survive with the parachute or without the parachute? Maxim, right? With okay, do you need a study to prove that? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, no. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, clinical benefits that we as a practitioners can feel less post sensitivity since we start to use ideas in proper way. This is highlight the proper way. 
then totally. there is no there is no way to have dentin contaminated with bacteria because the provisional restoration totally. that we use they are not perfect they are not hermetic so the exactly. result is there is to have the contamination so that is the and another Maxine, clinical proof one more thing the seal Imagine when you do a pulp exposure, of course it should not happen, but let's say accidental exposure of a pulp, you seal the, the exposure, whatever you want, I don't care, calcium hydroxide, MTA, that's not the point. The point is no bacteria. And so how do you obtain that? Immediate dentin seal. That's the answer. So immediate dentin sealing uh, after pulp exposure is absolutely fundamental. Why? Because if you restore, you, you don't want to restore that tooth definitively, immediately. Why? Because the shrinkage of the composite is going to pull on your adhesive. You might have a gap. You want to do IDS and place a totally non-shrinking material on top and let the tooth heal. That's the best. It's IDS. Another thing, same with endodontically treated teeth. IDS, you know, I, I said that yesterday, I consider endodontically treated teeth as the same as a pulp exposure. The canal must be sealed 100%. So, and there is a new thing. You can seal the dentin before you do endo. It's actually even better because then you prevent the dentin to be contaminated by all the products that you use during endo. And then you complete that sealing after you finish endo. You do dual, you do double IDS when you do endo. And that's been published, by the way, by someone. I just, there's an article about pre-endodontic sealing. Mm, nice. So it's pre-endodontic dentin sealing, okay? Perfect, so let me explain now clinical ways, clinical steps for audience about IDS, okay, when we do preparations just briefly to give to to get the closed circle for them to take this information away so when we prep when we prep for example inlays or overlays or crown lays whatever we have some cavities now in this case after we finished our preparation uh, we do ids which means bonding protocol in dentin including rubber dam isolation roughening of the dentin and all the steps that we have already discussed Okay, we cover dentin exposed with a little bit of portion of enamel in the periphery with adhesive. And then undercuts that we have out of carious excavation can be filled with flowable composite or um, bulk fill composite or packable composite. So basically we're doing uh, this thing that is called CDO, Cavity Design Optimization by Didier Dici. By the way, he will be here. Ah, yes. Uh, yes. During yes. Live they, and what I soon. call... Yeah, and I like also the terminology of Dr. David Alman, which is the biobase. Huh? Biobase, okay. So we do this biobase. So, and one, one thing more, uh, uh, Maxim, is it's not only filling undercuts. It could be also making a small dentin buildup so that your restoration is not so thick. Exactly. For and that you can material. easily polymerize the, the, the looting agent through the restoration, yes. Perfect. That's why I'm not doing endo crowns because I want to work with my right. light curable material. So I do build up, decreasing the thickness totally. of material. I mean, ceramic right. or yes. indirect. You know, there is one situation where I would suggest the endo crown is when you have very little occlusal clearance. And when you have low occlusal clearance on an endodontically treated tooth, you want to use the endo design because it gives you more thickness of material in the central groove. Mm, and okay. I would suggest that when you have short clinical crowns, I suggest the endo crown, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but otherwise, I agree with you. A small dentin buildup is my first choice. Yeah, perfect. So then we refine our enamel with a, with a fine diamond. And then we can take impression, actually. So this is when we have cavities. Well, uh, one more thing. <laughs> impression will interact with ideas. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, there, so here, it's difficult to say, but different adhesive will have different thicknesses of uh, oxygen inhibition. And when you air block the surface with glycerin, uh, which is always recommended at the end to minimize, and actually air block will not eliminate completely the the oxygen inhibition layer, it will minimize. And that means 
that this, there is still a thin unpolymerized layer. And we look at the microscope. If you take a PVS impression, you will see a tiny unpolymerized uh, layer of, of material. Oh, so okay. what you have to do is you have to physically remove that layer by gently pumicing uh, and cleaning the surface yeah, before you take point. your impression. Especially for polyethyl materials like impregnum. Uh, no, polyethyl, you have another problem. It's the opposite actually is stick. Fixed. Yeah, so if true. you clean, so if you have a fresh layer of Optimon they fell, you uh, air block it and then you remove, you pumice it. Polyethers, uh, that is a little bit, it is very interesting because Optimon they fell adhesive is a little bit hydrophilic. That's a little bit the, the miracle of Optimon they fell. There's a little bit of HEMA in the adhesive. And so polyethers will stick to the Optimon they fell because of that hydrophilicity. And then you have adherences. And you know, Maxim, what's the only way to avoid 100% of those adherences is to problem. cover with flowable composite. Ah, okay. So, because flowable composite will not uh, generate adherences with, uh, with uh, polyethers. So, it's the only indication if you want to have a flowable layer uh, which would not be for design optimization, would be if you use uh, a polyether material. Nice, thanks. Can we remove this oxygen inhibited layer with alcohol, wiping out this with alcohol? Yeah, I would tend to say yes, um, but to be honest with you, I don't think we have any data about that. Um, we, the, the, the problem with alcohol, I'm afraid that it will remove a lot of unpolymerized monomers that may be needed when we bond back. I don't know the answer of that, to be honest with you. I would tend to say yes, uh, but uh, my first choice would be physically removing it with pumps. Okay, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that because, because you know, when we I come did... back, we bond back to that layer. And alcohol, we know, is a solvent of, 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 of unpolymerized resin. So you don't want to completely remove uh, this, but keep some monomers, right? Because you need them for bonding back. No, we know that. Uh, Optibond FL will not polymerize more than 50% of conversion rate, which is very good news because that means 50% is still available for resin to resin bonding. And that's well, also a question I would like to answer. Is like when you come back to bond to that layer, you can come back weeks later. We, we, we made a study where we waited until 12 weeks uh, with a provisional and came back and removed that and air abraded, air abraded the Optibond FL layer. And again, with the immediate denting sealing, I want your uh, audience to understand this. If the IDS layer is too thin, how do you clean it predictably without reopening denting? That's the problem. So with Optibond FL, because of the adhesive, because of the thickness, when you air abrade it, and because of the uniform thickness, you have less risk of re-exposing denting. And one more thing, Maxim, this is super important. A lot of people are, are having, not a lot, I hope, but I hear people having post-operative sensitivity with ideas. I even saw a, oh my gosh, a study published showing that IDS doesn't work and it's not useful and what you see in the microscope, scanning electron microscope, is that the surfaces where the group that was IDS, the dentin tubules were open. Uh, Reopened because that of the means, refreshment. That, that means they didn't use, you know, air block. They didn't, uh, the, the, the adhesive was air thinned. And so it didn't polymerize. And that's what I want you to remember. Thin layers of adhesive do not polymerize well. And that's why you have to be careful. So imagine mm -hmm. you place mm -hmm. a very thin layer of adhesive, you don't air block it, you come back, you air braid it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And then you have sensitivity. And yeah, then you say, so oh, ideas doesn't work. <laughs> you understand the problem. This is very important. So, so when you air braid, and you know, as I said yesterday, I'm a human being. So sometimes my adhesive is a little bit thin here, or I didn't extend enough. So, I see a tiny little exposure of dentin after I have already etched. 
Now you need to take care of that by reapplying a little bit of primer there. Then you apply the adhesive, you don't polymerize during cementation I'm talking about, right? And then you place the restoration. At least this small area will be taken care of. But if you look at my book, uh, Maxim, in the, under here, here. the, uh, it was uh, in the, um, uh, there is a, <laughs> a page where I can actually show you right now. Oops, <coughs> excuse me, my phone fell off. And I want to show you something right now directly from the book here. And, uh, okay, as you see, this is my, uh, my worn off version here. Mm -hmm. And so if I go to the chapter about immediate dentin sealing, um, you will see a picture of a case that failed. And that failed because half of the preparation was treated with immediate dentin sealing and half of the preparation was not treated with immediate dentin sealing. Very interesting. And so the, the veneer fractured half. So you have after five years, half of the veneer was gone, the mesial half was intact, and the distal half was broken. Uh, I'm looking for it right now. So we can say that IDS actually improves bonding strength for yes. indirect restoration. It, exactly. And so the half side that fractured, and this, this is not in the book, but it will be in the next book, but the half side that fractured, we bonded it back with IDS. And that was 20 years ago. Wow. And so, and, and that veneer is still working as we speak. Right. After five years, after five years, it failed because one side was placed without IDS. Okay. And it was repaired with ideas, and it lasts another 15 years. Wow. So actually, now we have proof that ideas actually increase uh, bonding it's, strength. It's not a Clinical proof, but I'm scientific. just telling you, it's an, an it's anecdotal. But of course, we have scientific proof. And by the way, uh, uh, Marco Gresnik just published a clinical study about yeah, ideas. Yeah, I, I read, where, read the article and yeah. I have this product. And, and, and that relates directly to the question. You sent me some questions and one of the questions was, you know, about um, uh, when you have a, a large dentin exposures. And so if you have more than 50% of dentin exposed, that's con considered a large exposure. That's not a reason to do a crown. Of course not. That's a reason to do IDS and bond. And the prognosis of this veneer will be the same the as the double. Exactly, exactly. So and this I, is the I numbers think of the people. Yeah, yeah we, I know. We'll, we'll come I back mean, to it's reversed now, now, but I guess okay, sorry, yeah. I know. I, <laughs> I know what the, the, the. I'll go back. Yeah, I would like opinion. to give some clinical tips for the audience when we have uh, indirect preparations like crowns, for example, which you don't know, or veneers, let's say, and we have dentin exposure and we don't have cavity. So basically we are working with a flat or plain surface and we have to do the IDS in proper way. So I would like to, to give my tips and tricks because I also have experience with that for about eight years. Mm -hmm. Clinical experience, I can prove good. it works. Very good. Very so basically good. what Very we do, uh, actually we have in classic way, we have three steps of preparation, like, uh, like initial prep, rough preparation, then final prep finishing, and let's say polishing or refining the margins which is step three. So basically what I do, we finish step one and we notice that we have exposed dentin. Then we go to step two with the red, red diamond burr. During step two, we can expose dentin a little bit more. Unfortunately, it, it, it happens. So then afterwards, I realized that I would go with IDS and I have to utilize thick layer of adhesive, which is about, as you said, about 50 or 70 microns, right? It has to be, the thickness of the bonding agent it has to be 50 or 60 microns, which is pretty thick. We have to keep this in our mind because if that is, it will be thin, it will be not polymerized correctly. This I'm repeating your words. And uh, during cementation procedure, when you will air abrade the tooth, 
your ideas may disappear. So basically it has to be thick. So in that case, what we have to keep in our mind, when we open Dentin and we finished step two preparation, I go a little bit more in Dentin just to give me some space to get this thickness yes. for Especially for when you are close to the margins, especially when you are close to the margin. And I would say, if your margin is indenting, it's not a problem. But your chamfer has to be a little bit deeper, maybe one or two tenths deeper, to make the space for Optibon de Fel. Yes. Perfect. So my chamfer would turn into a very mini, mini shoulder, if you want. And when you apply a fell, you know, in this shoulder, it will naturally flow and create a chamfer. Yeah, for sure. So basically, when we have margins in enamel, so in this case, after step two, we give our, ourselves a little bit more space for the IDS. We light cure it. We put air block. We light cure again. And then I use disc or rubber just to refine my enamel. And then I take my diamond burr, red, low speed, just to refine my margin in enamel to keep it free from adhesive. That is important. But if I have my margin in dentin, I go for all three steps of preparations. And as, as you mentioned, I create a little bit more thicker space in marginal area, which is dentin nowadays. It's not enamel, unfortunately, to keep space for the Optimon FL or for flowable composite just to give myself uh, enough thickness for, for the ideas. Then we light cure, then we uh, air block, then before we take impression, we, as you said, you have to get some pumice space or whatever just to remove this oxygen inhibited layer to take a proper impression. Right. Right. And just to tell you, the, it's funny, one day I was talking to a... I treated back when I was still in Switzerland, you know, more than 15 years ago. Um, I think I treated that patient like seven or 18 years ago. And it was a case of severe erosion. But Maxim, very, like when we prepped and we, we, we had like, uh, you know, some teeth, it was 80, 90% of, uh, of dentin exposed. And uh, Michel, of course, did the feldspatic, not Emacs. Because this is another thing I see people, of course, we can also make this very important conclusion. The more you bond, the less you need strong materials. And feldspatic is good when it's even bonded to dentin, when the dentin one is correct. And so this case was made with creation porcelain 17 years ago. And guess what? Dentin margins. Th those teeth. Many of the people in your survey would have done a crown instead, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. That is the problem number three that I raised up. People still don't know which way to go, to do crown or to do veneer or minimal invasive restorations because they don't have correct protocol and they don't believe in adhesive dentistry. This is the thing. Right. But once they will have results, they will get confidence and then will will switch into the minimal invasive approach in restorative dentistry right. for sure. Really. So let I us really hope that we have to, sorry? Yeah, I really hope that uh, you guys who are listening, all that we discussed today will help you um, get a better experience with IDS. And, and of, co of course the devil is in the detail. <laughs> so it's like you have to uh, consider all these elements we discussed. I, I, I think we really covered it all. Uh, and uh, otherwise there, there's lots of articles. There's a, a huge amount of literature about IDS, most of which, thanks God, is positive. And, and, and if there are still some few articles that say, well, it doesn't make a difference, Look carefully how they did it, and you will discover that some of those articles they didn't respect the principles that we talked about today. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me do some summary. So IDS clinically uh, gives you less, way less post operative sensitivity. Gives you better bonding strength for indirect restoration, which is proved clinically, and it can give you possibility to go for less invasive types of restorations, which means you prep less 
and you benefit out of the biological environment that you protect. So that is proved. Yes, it takes time. We have to admire that we have to spend our time for the ideas, but again, it is, it is not spending of our time. It is investment, as you said. And, and you know what, Maxim? <laughs> I remember what you just said. When you put your seat belt, you know, it takes a few seconds to put the seat <laughs> belt, right? So IDS is that. It's your seat belt, okay? Invest in the seat belt, please. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So I really appreciate your time. I, just three Thank quick you, questions. Maxim. Let's, let's do a really quick three questions for you. I will ask you questions without, without thinking, and you will answer yes. without thinking, okay, really quickly. Woo! So first, okay, let me cut the connection here. Yeah, it's simple questions. First, CAD CAM or manual? Both. <laughs> okay. Hybrid. <laughs> Hybrid. <laughs> Hybrid. Okay, zirconia or glass ceramic? Oh, glass ceramic. Easy. Okay. Glass ceramic or composite? Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I would, I'm going to tell you composite, but uh, that would require an explanation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it depends for sure. It depends. It's just, it's just the funny questions. Okay, that's Absolutely. perfect. I hope that people enjoyed this conversation, that they got a lot of clinical tips from Real Master, from primary, primary source of the ideas. Uh, Thank you. Concept, actually. Yeah, it is. It is concept. And Pascal, I'm really, I'm really, uh, I'm really thankful for your time, for, for your efforts, Thank you. for all the contribution that you made for dentistry. And uh, I really suggest for all of my followers, my people, to see Pascal in life, to attend his courses, to buy and to read the book because it is Bible, and to read all the articles that Pascal and his team actually publish in uh, the, the way, the field of uh, adhesive dentistry because they are professional, life-changing. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank and you, Maxim. God bless you much. all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Maxim. Bye-bye. Thank you.